This is episode 71 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 71 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today I have Gary Hibbert on the show and Gary is one of these people that I just stumbled across. I happened to hear an episode that he was on of a different podcast, heard him talking and I'm like, man, this guy is going to be fun to have on the podcast. Uh, he just has so much wisdom. He's been in the game for a real long time and I picked up on it right away, but his mindset is just all the way there. Um, he really does have his uh, his head in the game. He uh, has systems that he has implemented in his life that allow him to stay focused, stay stay working towards his goals. And he's created an abundance of cash flow in his life uh, with his real estate portfolio. So right now he's sitting at 14 properties and uh, it was previously higher, but he's looking at new types of investments that are more passive uh, because he's really established what it is that he wanted to establish and it is in line with his goals. A really fun part of this episode was that Gary and I just dug into our opinions about the current situation and what's happening, the shutdown, how it was handled and what it means in the in the larger scale. On that note, because this episode was actually recorded a couple of weeks ago. As I'm recording this intro, it is June 19th. The episode was from June 2nd. I did just want to give a couple of updates. We're now opening up. We're seeing bars and restaurants actually opening up for patio use as of today. And uh, to me, it was a long time coming. It's no secret I'm opinionated, so I might as well just keep rolling with it. I, as you know, do not agree with this shutdown. I never did agree with the way the shutdown was handled. And uh, I just don't think that the government ever explained to us what the plan was, how it made logical sense, and how it was going to protect us. Um, we do have a, an absolute civic duty to understand what's going on in our government understand the basis of their decisions and they have an obligation to tell us we just really haven't had that lately as always guys i'll just ask you to please continue to question things please continue to stand up to your politicians stand up against rules that don't make sense and and stand for truth because at the end of the day truth and free speech seem to be quashed a heck of a lot these days that's just not the way it's meant to be i love this free society that we've grown up in and i want to see it continue and i'm so happy to see things opening up and and this time we're going to keep it this way no matter what happens let's let's resolve that we're going to keep it this way and we're going to hold our ourselves and we're going to hold our politicians accountable to make sure that that does happen and that we come up with a plan that actually makes sense and actually works so without digressing too much more i did just want to ask if you could please uh, take a moment and just go ahead and rate and review this podcast on whatever platform you listen to. As far as I understand, Apple Podcasts is the platform that will allow you to write a review. I, I think that there are some others that will allow it as well. And if you're watching on YouTube and you haven't already done so, please just hit that like and subscribe button and make sure that you also hit the notification bell so you get notified when the new episodes come out. Thank you so much to the people who already wrote really, really nice reviews. I just took a look through and I really appreciate everything you're doing to uh, help spread the word about this podcast and help it grow. Without further ado please enjoy today's episode i know you're going to enjoy it it was a heck of a lot of fun to, to chat with gary so enjoy episode 71. hello and welcome to the andrew hines real estate investing podcast i've got gary hibbert on the show today and uh gary thank you very much for being here hey listen thank you very much for having me i'm uh, i'm excited to be, uh, to do this and uh, you know i think it's very some some very interesting times that we're we're living through right now so we'll see where this conversation takes us <laughs> yeah you know what I, I i actually had heard your name around i didn't even realize you had your own podcast and then i yeah. i saw you do an interview and i love interviewing podcast hosts because you always always have lots to say and lots of yeah. good questions to ask <laughs> so um this will be fun and um yeah but just to start off um give me a little bit of background and, and our listeners and viewers a bit of background on you yeah sure um i mean we'll start back i guess in in, in 2008 uh, i used to work for uh, for td bank uh and um <sighs> I wonder where I should take this. You know, I, I can go real long or real deep on this, but I'm sure you got lots of other questions you want to get into. But I'll, I'll give it to you in a nutshell. Anyways, 2008, this is when they had the whole financial crisis. And um, Canada didn't really get hit hard by it. However, people were losing their jobs uh, during that time. And I went into work. It was, we called it a Black Monday sat down in my cubicle one of my coworkers got called in and um when i saw the look at his face i was like oh shit, it's on and he had just got let go and all day long they were just firing people and um 
uh, fortunately, I survived. I made it. And, and I really needed to keep the job. I just had bought a house. I got two young kids at home, a wife at home. And I was like, never again do I ever want to feel like somebody is in control of my financial freedom or future. And uh, that really led me down the road of real estate. And, uh, and I had to learn. I had to get financially educated. And uh, from there, I started my own real estate investment club, um, which is called Smart Home Choice. And so educating other investors, but also educating myself and let people uh, see who I was. And I just made myself very vulnerable, knowing that, hey, I didn't know a whole lot about this, but this is a journey that I'm going to take. And if you want to come along with me, um, I'm more than happy to share what I'm learning and, uh, and teach you about financial education and the importance of um, you know, having assets in your portfolio. It's interesting that you took that approach. And I think more people need to do that, right? Don't, don't act like you know everything right off the bat. Just say, hey, come along for the journey. I'll share what I'm learning with you. And right. I think that's a great approach to get going. And I think a lot of people like just on the social media front, they don't want to share early on because they're like, well, what can I add? You know, what can I do? Right. But yeah. There's listen, so much and, you and can add. For sure. And just listen, and there's things that I should probably even know today that I don't. Uh, and, and so I think it's just a matter of just kind of just being vulnerable. There's certain things that I'm good at and that, and that I know very well. And there's other things that I'm open to, mm-hmm. to learning about. And I think that's probably why I enjoy the podcast. I get to sit down and talk to people that are very knowledgeable and learn from them and uh, listen to things that make sense and, and apply it to my life and other things that may not, um, you know, even if I not, may not agree with it, doesn't mean I don't have to respect that person right yeah absolutely there's well there's so much we can learn right just from even a different style of thinking like just you might think about a situation differently from me so if i hear you explain it i'll be like wow never thought of it that way you know and if i apply that thinking maybe i'll do a deal that i wouldn't have or you know no matter no matter where we're, we're at i think it's so important that we're we're continuing to learn. So um, I just thought I'd point that out about what you were saying. I think that's great that, that you started that way. That's obviously a long time ago now, right? You've been at this quite some time. Um, so Correct. just for some context, um, what's a snapshot of your, of your portfolio look like right now? Yeah. So when I first started, um, and, and so prior to starting the club, I, I, the first investment property I bought in 2008 was a, uh, uh, a, a two unit or burr I mean, I didn't know what a burr was back in 2008, but everybody, I think for the most part now that have invested in real estate know what it is. Um, right. and, uh, and, I, and so the first two properties I bought were t- duplexes or two units. Okay. And uh, just made a complete mess of the second one. Didn't know what I was doing. Had no idea how to screen tenants. And, uh, and then I had to take a step back. And probably one of the best things that I ever did was I joined a, a real estate investment club and uh, just learned about real estate investing from other people that were that were doing it as opposed to trying to learn from people at work because I initially I wanted to learn and get into it earlier and back in 2001 and uh, you know talking to a friend at work he was just like yeah don't do it it's too it's too risky you're gonna lose everything Um, but anyway so from there I stepped back, got into rent to own, love that type of investing. Um, once I got really good at it, um, I then revisited the two unit investing and uh, realized that, you know, it, that, you know, was a great way to build a portfolio as well too, because, um, you know, if one tenant left, I still had somebody else in there. And, uh, and I also have a mix of the single family homes and that's kind of where I've stopped. And now I've kind of stepped back now. I've kind of released a couple of my pro- properties and now I'm going into, um, private lending. So portfolio wise at one point in time, I'd own maybe close to, you know, 30 properties. I'm down to maybe about 14, 15 now. And, and I'm comfortable with that. That's a, that's a good solid number. Um, you know, a lot of people are, are striving for that I'm, I'm not at 14. So yeah, you're, you're killing it. That's uh, that's amazing. And, well, um, you. Whereabouts are your properties? Um, they are in mostly in the Durham region. So I've got Durham. Um, okay. I've got uh, a few out in Peterborough. Um, I'd gone out to Barry, um, and uh, I actually had one out in Kitchener. And mm-hmm. what I realized when I was starting to expand in some of those different markets was that um, I wasn't really an expert in those areas. So I, so I live out in Ajax, okay. and uh, and I think it really helps when you are familiar with the city that you're investing in. I'm not knocking, you know, investing in other markets. It's just um, mm-hmm. because my market was so good. I was like, you know what? Let me just stay here. There's lots of phenomenal diamonds out here that I can find, and so 
Um, I love the Durham market, um, but we do a lot out in Peterborough right now. I'd say probably 90% of our business is up in Peterborough, and there's still lots of room for growth up there. They just put the uh, the 47 right along the top of the Durham region, and that allows um, a lot of families to be able to commute back into the city yeah. uh, instead of going the other way and, and fighting that 4-1 traffic out to Mississauga or Oakville, right? So, um, yeah. And the rents are great. The prices are good. It just makes sense. Yes. So you're in Ajax. Most of your portfolio is there, you're saying, or between there and Port, uh, Peterborough? Between there and Peterborough. So okay. Curtis, have, Bowmanville. Do you still have the Kitchener one or stuff no, in Barry? We, no, we got rid of the Kitchener one and we just got rid of the Barry one uh, this year. So last year we started um, 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 getting rid of a few of our properties just because we were moving into another area. And, and I think it's really important where you, you take a look at, because there was a time when we were thinking about going down the, um, the apartment route. And so me and my wife, we went and took some courses on it and uh, because it just felt like it was the right thing to do because everybody else is doing it, right? Like you go single family, then you go to the two, then you go to triplex, and then mm-hmm. you go to the, you know, 10 units and you got to go to the apartments. And so that's what we thought that was the next step. And, you know, it went out, I don't know if you know, um, Casey Wong. So went out yep. with him and checked out a few of his, uh, apartments that he's got out there. And, um, I remember we came home and I'm like, I don't know. It's just, it just doesn't, there's something not kind of sitting right with me. And again, not to knock it, it just wasn't our, it wasn't suiting the lifestyle that we were trying to do and trying to create. And, uh, and I was really enjoying the podcast. And it was a couple of the things that I wanted to do. And then, uh, we stepped back, talked to one of my early mentors that helped me get into real estate investing. He's like, you know what, why don't you maybe take a look at the private lending space? You know, like how many more homes do you really need? How many more, how, how many, why do you need a hundred doors or 200 doors? And and I stepped back and me and my wife looked at each other and we're like, you know what? Yeah, we don't. We don't need that many doors. It's just, we don't need to, you know? And so I think it's important and where you sit down and you write down your goals, write down what's important to you, and then you work in that space. And that's what we did. And so that's when we ended up offloading a few of our properties and, and, and yeah. moved in that direction. And I, I've actually thought about that too, as a longer term strategy, you know, get to a certain point, liquidate that, you know, just put it into private lending, which is much more hands off. Granted, nothing's mm-hmm. truly hands off. I mean, even private lending, you have to be uh, very diligent about your approach. Otherwise you're going to be taking back properties and having fun with that. Exactly. Uh, yeah. For those who don't know, private lending is just when you're, you're acting as the bank, you're, you're the person writing the loan and somebody else is paying you interest. You can do it just like the bank. We don't talk about that much on this. We usually talk about borrowing money, uh, right. lots of private lending to borrow, but, uh, yeah, I've actually done both, but in, in smaller amounts on the, on the lend side. Okay. Um, okay. I've got some, uh, some questions for you. So you got up to 30 properties currently at 14. How did you get to so many? Obviously we know the banks are usually capping people out at five to 10. Of course you were doing this starting back a little, you know, a little while ago. Uh, right. did you get into joint ventures to make that happen? And do you still yeah. have some of those? Yep. And, and that's, that's exactly what I did. I think, mm-hmm. um, you know, people think that you need money to make money. I know there was a time in my life as well too, where I was like, man, I want to get into real estate investing, but I just, I don't have the money. I don't know how to do it. And, um, I think the most important thing is to number one, educate yourself. Number two, understand that, uh, you can leverage and use either other people's money, creating win-win scenarios, um, or you can use the bank's money. And, and that's what I had to do. One of the best books I ever read um, was um, uh, by Stefan Arneo. Um, and I know he's no longer with us. And uh, he was a phenomenal teacher. I learned a lot from him. We were really good friends. And uh, it was Money People Deal. Yeah. And that one really changed, uh, I would say, the way that I looked at uh, structuring deals together and, and realizing that the money wasn't the most important piece of it. It was the actual deal. And so I got really good at finding really good deals um, and then putting that together and then finding um, you know, my partners that wanted to uh, partner with me and creating uh, something that was going to produce them a better return on what they were getting with the RSPs or with a mutual fund. and. Mm-hmm. And really showing them the importance of trying to outpace inflation. And not only just outpace inflation, but showing them the real numbers of inflation. Because see, people yeah. think that inflation is really doing this, this number that they're showing is 2 or 3%, which is bullshit. 
Total, I, I yeah. Know if and it's I'm wearing your podcast that or not, but <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's a, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's garbage, right? And yeah. um, and and so that was really what I wanted to help and show people. And so by doing that, that's what I did. I I, I learned how to use and leverage other people's money. Yeah. And so a couple of interesting things you, you, you pointed out there. I mean, Stefan Arneo's book, uh, Money People Deal, I, I think I've pretty much read or almost through all of his books at this point. Um, right. That one, I'm trying to remember the, the three things to bring to a deal. I mean, in my simple logic is um, if you have, and I've said this, and I know some people would argue with me, if you have a really, uh, really great deal, the money will come, right? Because if right. you have a really great deal, you will be enthusiastic. And if you have the competence and the good deal, then the money is the other element you need. Stefan has a right. different way of putting that. Do you remember what it is or is that roughly what he, uh, what he had said? Uh, I don't know. I mean, he's, he's taught so many different things and yeah. great, great, great lessons. So I, I don't, yeah. I don't recall, but okay. I know, but, but I mean, just to add to what you're saying, yeah, yeah it, it wasn't so much that I was selling the deal. Mm -hmm. I was selling the dream. I was selling right. the, uh, what was gonna, what was, what was I going to do for them being able mm -hmm. to maybe take more vacations or to now maybe have enough cash flow coming in to make payments for, for the car right. that they wanted to get. That's what I was doing. And so when I brought that passion, mm -hmm. um, you know, that is where they actually saw the vision because look, a lot of times people think that you actually have to sit down and show them the deal. A lot of times I was more selling that lifestyle. And then at yes. the end of the meeting, I would say, Hey, look, here's a deal that he just recently did. Take it home, check it out, see if you like it. Um, but not explain the numbers to them. Right, right. Right. Because they were investing in me, not the actual property. That's, uh, that's like fantastic advice. And I know my, uh, my good friend, he, uh, he actually gets a lot of people, uh, private lenders in doing it exactly that way. He'll sit down with them, find out what it is that they want, and then he'll help them get it. And one of the mm -hmm. ways he helps them get it is through allowing them to invest with him. So to find right. out, you know, the guy wants to own a Harley Davidson. Well, he'll work out the numbers. Okay, what's that cost? Okay, what's the payment on that thing cost? And he'll work out how much money they would have to borrow on their line of credit and lend to him uh, to create that amount of income. He's like, how'd you like it if I showed you a way to get that for free? I'm like, oh, are you kidding me? Of course, yeah. of course we'd <laughs> want that. He's like, great. Here's what we have to do. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and that's how he got his deals done. And, and I think the beautiful thing is, is there's so many different ways that you can sell, sell that dream as you put it. Um, when you're, when you're, you know, talking to a potential partner or somebody that's reached out to you that, that wants to be a partner, it's all like, again, if you don't believe in it as the person selling it, no one's gonna, no one's gonna want it. Right. But if you do, then, uh, then there you go. Yeah, exactly. Right. Listen, at the end of the day, people think that I, I love real estate investing Real estate investing is boring. Like there's nothing exciting about it. It's bricks, it's mortar, it's it's a roof. Dry. Like there's nothing exciting about it. It's the lifestyle. That's why I'm doing it. It's what it allows me to be able to do to be able to take trips. Well, when we used to be able to take trips whenever I wanted to, <laughs> you know, be able to get a cottage and 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 take yeah. the summers off and and enjoy it with my friends and family. That is what real estate investing does. It's outpacing inflation. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to come back to that inflation note. I'm going to, cause yep. I know I've heard you had some thoughts on some things and I have some similar thoughts. So we're going to, we're going to dig in. Yeah. Um, all right, cool. Tell me about the, the lifestyle. What's a day in the life for you? A day in the life. Um, mm -hmm. like from the time that I wake up time that I wake up, um, geez, very first thing that I do is I roll out of bed. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and I do about a two minute workout. So I'll do uh, some crunches I'll do some sit-ups just to get the blood flowing. Right. And, uh, and, and I find that really helps just to kind of get my mind awake. Then I'll, I'll pop into my office. This is usually around 7 o'clock in the morning. And uh, before I even open up my emails or go through anything, is I sit down and I will go through my agenda. And I'll take a look at my whiteboard. So I've got my whiteboard in my office. Mm -hmm. And uh, my whiteboard is tied very closely to what I have to work on for the week because those are my goals for the year. I, I don't have my five-year goals on there. I, I'll put that down, put it away, because I think that's too lofty. But if you can work on just a one-year goal and then put down the month of months, like when you want to achieve it, and then work on your agenda. So then now what I'm doing is I'm designing my day. I'm not concerned with any emails that come in because those are just tasks from other people. I'm not saying they're not important. However, it's not part of my design. 
And so I design my day. I figure out what my day is going to look like. Um, and then I will scan through the emails really quickly, just in case there's anything urgent there, maybe a deal that I'm working on, whatever. And then I go downstairs, uh, I'll have a coffee, have a cup of tea, and either watch something educational for half hour, 40 minutes, or get maybe just kind of caught up in the news. Uh, then uh, I come back up and then I'll actually start working on the things that I actually have in my agenda for that day. I usually don't even touch any emails until around 10, 1030, because I just don't want it to take away from the life and design and the dreams that I'm working towards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. big difference there is reacting versus being intentional, right? Even when you get emails, you're, you have to react to them, right? Whereas if you are starting your day off, I like that. You're kind of creating it. Exactly. Um, rather than allowing other people to control your day. And I actually, in my daily life, that's what I aim to get rid of is when people have a dependence on, dependency on me and responses from me and need answers from me. I like to mm -hmm. eliminate that and create a system. Like if I have one of my employees tackle it now, no, no, you, you take care of that. <laughs> right. Because I'd rather and, and be intentional. Right, exactly. Yeah. Because then what will end up happening too is a way that people send you emails is like, hey, uh, Andrew, look, I, I know you're incredibly busy. So now they know that you're busy because you're not responding back and forth with them all day long. Mm -hmm. Again, unless it's something that you're obviously working on or it's important. Yeah. Yes, I get I get, and I understand that. But uh, I really try to pull myself out of that. And, and it's hard. It's not easy. It's, it's taken me years to be able to achieve that. Um, right. Because uh, in the beginning, you know, you, you want to take every single email that comes in every, cause that's part of your business that you're growing. Right. But once you get to the point where you, you don't have to be reactive, it, it's, it's such a better place to be. Absolutely. Um, do you mind telling me a little bit about some struggles you've had along the way? Cause you started off as a guy kind of sharing your journey, um, didn't know much. And now you obviously know a lot and you're very experienced. Um, mm -hmm. talk to me about kind of some of the trials and tribulations that happened there. Was there anything significant that happened to you that like shaped, shaped the way you are as an investor? Yeah. Some of the struggles that I had, oh, man, I hated public speaking. I still do. I hate public speaking. I hate, uh, I love doing podcasts, but there are times that I do get nervous depending on the guests and the, the, the people that I have on this show. And so I've had to build on that. I've had to work at that. And, uh, and I think people think that sometimes that it was like, Oh man, you make it look so easy or, or you're just gifted at this. And I think what people have to understand is that I think people's true gifts are they don't rely on, they don't lie on the surface they're actually embedded in you mm -hmm. and you actually have to chisel and get it out and i think that's part of the enjoyment of the journey of digging deep finding your true passion and knowing that it doesn't come easy see people think just everything just comes easy and i, th and I think that's false because then once it's not then you're like oh well this is not my this is not my gift and i think if your gift is so easy well, then everybody would be able to just have this phenomenal life. And I think that's the journey, the, the, the enjoyment of the journey is finding that gift that's buried inside you. Interesting. I hadn't heard it put that way, but I like that quote. That's almost like something somebody should put on their Instagram wall. Uh, true gifts are embedded in us and you have to chisel them out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something along those lines. <laughs> All right. We'll put Gary here right there. How you, can, you can send me the official quote. <laughs> yeah. We'll, uh, you, we'll use it for a teaser. It, and so those were my struggles in the beginning, you know, being in that public spotlight, um, you know, people looking to me to, for help and for guidance and, you know, not maybe always believing in myself and, you know, who am I to really help all these investors and, you know, am I doing the right thing? Is now the right time to invest? So I think it's just always questioning yourself. Are you doing the right thing? Are you leading people in the right direction? I think those would be the okay. biggest, you know, struggles I've had. So that's, that's the big thing that kind of weighs on you is, is, is your impact on others at this point. It, it, it was now okay. I'm more comfortable with it. Now I'm, I, I, I'm just more of a beacon because before it was more like, I'm going to help everybody. And you realize that well you can't. And so now I'm just more comfortable being a beacon and whoever wants to come along on that journey with me or to learn from me, then I'm more than happy to help them. And how do you do that? Or is it uh, people that are JV partners with you or is it people that you coach or how, how do you? Yeah, it would be more along. Um, I think the, through the podcast is number one and through the education there. Mm -hmm. 
helping them get into real estate investing. I don't really do a whole lot of JVs anymore, um, but I will help them and pair them up with uh, our, our other club mm-hmm. members that we have, if, if that's what they're looking for. Um, and uh, webinars and uh, whatever type of investment that they want to get into. We, we're really what I've done is just created like an education company. Right. Okay. Do you have a, do you have a name for your, your like, smart home it, choice? Oh yeah. Yep. So, so, still, yeah, still so smart, smart home, home choice. choice. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. essentially it's just like a one-stop shop. It's everything that you okay. need from the accountants, from the lawyers to, um, okay. you know, the real estate agents, uh, it, it's, it's all everything you needed. We have it. Okay. And, uh, when did you start the podcast? The podcast, I started that back and I think it was around maybe 2015, 2016, somewhere around there. Okay. And what made you and do I was, that? Um, what made me do that was it, it gave me an opportunity to be able to ask people that I looked up to and admired uh, really tough questions and learn from them. Mm-hmm. And it also, so it was a win-win. It was, I was learning. And I was also giving them a platform to talk about, you know, what they can offer to other people or their business or whatever it may be. Right. That's actually a similar reason why I started this one. It was, you know, two, 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 uh, fold, right. You know, you get the, the information out to people, but it gives me a chance to sit down for an hour with somebody that, you know, sometimes they might not actually take that hour otherwise. So it's really, uh, it's really cool to get that opportunity. It's, it's phenomenal to be able to sit down and just ask, questions and learn from some of the top investors or, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, people who have great coaching or mindset or whatever Mm -hmm. it may be, wherever direction you want to go with your podcast. It's, it's, it's incredible. Yeah. And I would say it's, it's really from what I gather after, you know, I've been an investor for nine years now. Um, yeah, it seems to come down to a mindset and a way of thinking more than anything. Like practical knowledge is, is very on the surface kind of, as you were talking about, um, uh, with, with, uh, you know, the passions and what you're good at, it's, it's really on the surface, but if you can, if you can glean from somebody, how they think about things, uh, that can be empowering for the rest of your life. That can give you an approach to finding information. Um, I, uh, and that, that actually leads me into the, the next question I wanted to ask you is I'm sure you've developed some, some kind of guiding principles along the way, things that guide the way you are as an investor, things you're not willing to budge on. Um, what would some of those things be? Um, in- integrity is one. Um, there's, there's one quote that I learned from Jim Rowan that always sticks with me is um, help as many people get what they want and you can have every and anything you want. I and just I heard like, that man, quote today. <laughs> and I'm like, can it really be that simple? Yeah. And, uh, and, and I, so I lived very closely to that philosophy. And I can mm-hmm. tell you 100%, not even 99.9, 100%, 9, it works. Because um, the more that you help other people, um, it, that good stuff just cannot help but come back to you. And then what ends up happening is that you, it's almost like this pipe that you can't even turn off. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, it's, it's just an abundance of, of, of good things that just happen to you. Uh, I'll give you, give you an example. And, and look, and I think if you just live your life like that, it'll change your whole entire life. Last week I went into, um, LCBO and I bought some beer. And so I came out and I thought it was kind of cheap, you know, the, the price tag after I'd picked up a couple cases there. And anyways, I looked at the receipt and, uh, he didn't charge me for two of the cases. Mm-hmm. And so uh, I told my wife she was in the car because she went to the grocery store and she was, well, you know what you need to do. And so I actually went back <laughs> and I, and I said, and there was a lineup and I go to the guy in front and go, Hey, listen, I just got to take these. Uh, I got to go back in because you guys didn't charge me for these two cases here. And he's like, he looks at me weird. He's like, okay. And so I went in there and there's like two or three people in there just looked at me really weird. I was like, wow, mm-hmm. that's incredible. You actually came back. You could have just left and not have to worry about paying for this, but it's just, I know how karma works. I've seen yeah. it works and it usually comes back 10 times, you know, harder than uh, yeah. if you just do the right thing. And so I'm old enough now to realize and understand that. Yeah. I, I'd say I learned that one too. Yeah. When I was younger, I never thought like that, but as you know, as I got older, I very much can resonate with, with that approach. Yeah. Um, any other sort of like guiding principles, real estate specific, like more thinking some of your specific technical approaches and uh-huh. like, I'm a cash flow guy. Like I, I've got to have it and I, I could go down that, that road, but, um, yep. you know, were there, are there some things that you've got to have in a deal? Like what makes a deal nice to you that you want to do? 
Yeah, it's uh, for me, it's, it's cash flow. I think that's always been the guiding principle if you look, want to look at it from a technical standpoint. And, uh, and one of the things that I learned early on is that, um, you know, if you take a look at a cake, the cake itself is the cash flow and the icing on top is the appreciation. And that's mm-hmm. the sweet stuff. And so then now if you live by that technical principle, well, then you never buy anything based on appreciation. And so I don't really care about appreciation. I will take it when I can, but I do it for the cash flow. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so that's one of the things that I'll, I, will, I, I won't bend on for any of my investors unless they're comfortable Mm-hmm. buying a property that doesn't cash flow. But for any of our classes that we teach is always cash flow based. And so that's one of the reasons why when we were investing in Durham, we then, when homes started going up like $10,000 a week, I don't know if you remember that back in early 2017, the market just went crazy. We literally took our whole entire business and moved to Peterborough. And then before we, we made any of our investors buy any properties out there, we bought a property out there first. We screened the tenants first to see what was happening there. Then we went to the city and had a conversation with them. So we dove in first before anybody else did. And then once we realized that we had something good here, then we moved our whole entire business up there. So it's always been cash flow. It's always about the numbers um, and, uh, and making sure that uh, it's, it's something that makes sense. Okay. And I'll, we're going to dig into some of the specific numbers, um, just sort of back, back of the envelope style, but, uh, economically, like, what do you look for? You know, what, when you went into Peterborough, how did you know that, that that's a good market for you? Not just because there was cash flow, but because you saw yep. longevity, like what, what made you believe that it has long-term like longevity? Yeah. So there's a couple of different things I'll look at. Number one, I look at vacancy. So vacancies were, were incredibly low out in Peterborough. Number two, I look at uh, infrastructure. Um, uh, so one was at 407. So to me, that's like building like another artery for your heart. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was huge. Um, number three, population. Uh, increase. So the population mm-hmm. out there was increasing, which I think is important. Number four, job growth. So they had job growth out there. What um, kind of industries know, up, do they have up there? I know they have a couple schools, right? Yeah. So they get the school. So it's always about following your eds and your meds, right? So education. So they got Trent University out there and they've also got, um, um, what's the other one there? Uh, there's Trent and uh it's the college oh there, the right? college fleming yeah. fleming, fleming yeah, yeah they got fleming they got the hospital out there uh fairly large hospital as well too a lot of doctors mm-hmm. and nurses out there uh they just opened up a casino out there as well too mm-hmm. so um so those are the main things that i really kind of take a look at is the fundamentals which are i think incredibly important before you just jump into a market yeah so yeah I'm, i couldn't agree more i mean I'm, for yeah. me i'm always trying to uh to figure out you know, if the worst happens, like I'm in student rentals. So if for some reason people shift away from student rentals, how am I hedged against that? You know, can my, my properties be repurposed? What other industries are are supporting? And as much as I like student rentals, if I were to go to a city that only had a school, then I might actually feel uh, pretty exposed and vulnerable of what Gary V predicts ever comes true. And, you know, people shift away from going to school. Not that I think that that would happen overnight, but uh, you know, it is something that could happen in the long run that there could be a slight shift away from, from school. Yeah. And and, and you should be looking at what are some of the worst case scenarios that could potentially happen. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's just like that ant philosophy, right? Like ants think winter all summer. Mm -hmm. And then when winter comes, they think summer all winter. So that's what you want to do. So while it's, it's, it's hot and it's warm and things are going great, what can happen down the road? And I mean, here's a great example that we're living through right now, COVID-19, where I think you're going to see a lot of speculative investors potentially um, get themselves in trouble, right? Where yeah. they thought that the market can never turn or, yeah. um, or um, you know, it, it, things are just going to always keep going up and up. Well, absolutely. And, and it's happening. So my wife's got a place in, in uh, Toronto that she bought for 510 back in the day and its value has gone up as high as probably like 900 or 880 or so. Um, mm-hmm. And she's done incredibly well and she has it rented for, for 3,700. She's had it rented for 4,000 as a furnished rental condo. And right. uh, now the market seems to be, and uh, you know, maybe she'll be able to get 3,000, maybe, maybe only 2,700. Um, so we're talking about a thousand dollar decrease in cash flow. 
Um, what does that do to somebody? I mean, she has a bit of a margin there, but what does that do to somebody who bought on spec? They were already negative cash flow, like a hundred bucks, which in reality right. is probably more like 300 bucks. Uh, right. And then all of a sudden you drop your rents at a thousand bucks. That is going to break people. And uh, the people yeah. who, who came and asked me, and there were many, uh, you know, hey, Andrew, I'm looking at this, this neighborhood in Toronto. I'm looking at this. I'm like, how's your cash flow? And the answer was, oh, well, you know, the area is really appreciating. I'm like, well, you have no plan B. What happens if plan A doesn't work out? What happens if the market doesn't go up? And um, the speculation is exactly what you're pointing out. And I had to get burned. It seems like you, you kind of escaped getting burned really badly. I had to get burned many times to learn my lesson, to not do things like that. Uh, right. And, you know, there came a point just like you where you saw stuff going up in value so much in, in uh, Ajax that you're like, mm, no, it's not going to work here anymore. We got to have, have our cash flow. Uh, the same thing happened to me in London. I'm like, okay, hitting the brakes for a second. I'm, you know, not until I find a market that I'm equally comfortable with uh, economically and has the cash flow, I'm going to hit pause. And uh, that's sort of the moment, you know, I've been in that little place for like the last year. And then, of course, this COVID thing happened. Right. So. And, and you- yeah. And you know what it was though in the beginning? Yeah. So from, I would say around 2009 to for about five, six years and still now, mm-hmm. but I mean, man, I was big on the education piece of it. Yeah. I was driving to Oakville. I was going to the rain meetings. I was going to the rockstar meetings. I was going yeah. to every meeting Smart. possible to get just the fundamentals. And even though I would, I would leave and I'm like, <sighs> I knew 98% of everything they talked about tonight, but it was that new Mm -hmm. 2%. I'm like, ah, that's new. That's a good new fundamental. And it just kept layering and layering. And look, here's a big difference between between the ones that are really good and sharp is that once, I think a lot of investors, they can get to that 80% pretty quickly Mm -hmm. of knowing, you know, a specific type of investing strategy, but it's that 81%, 81 and a half percent, 81.7%. That takes time, that takes years, and that takes continual education and learning. Yeah, that's a very interesting point you're making. And and I, if, if there was something I were to change rather than say I would change my mistakes, because that's sort of obvious, but they also shape me, it would be to, to go to those events. Like I never bought and bought the rain membership. I should have, you know, I, I didn't even know about Rockstar. I, you know, had I known back then I would have, you know, right. my network would have been bigger. I would have been way further along and probably could have avoided very, very painful mistakes. So I, <laughs> mistakes and mentors, the two ways uh, people learn, right? So um, yeah, you really absolutely. just got to pick it. Um, okay. So let's dig into uh, to some cash flow then. So I, I take it you're not really in the buy mode right now. You've been more in the sell mode. Uh, to, to I kinda, have. But yeah, talk, so talk to me about mode, And then now I'm in a, in, in a stability mode right stability, now. Stability, so yeah. Just, yep. And I like that too, because you don't need to just grow for the sake of growing. It has to fit with your goals. What are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? And if if you don't need to grow to accomplish that, then enjoy life. Do it, do it. You know, I think we're always going to grow in some way, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean need to be number of doors. Um, Okay. So let's talk about a deal that you've done. Like, were you mostly a burr guy or or was it? uh... My favorite strategy, I'll be honest with you, was rent to own. Okay. I loved rent to own. That was kind of the whole premise of when we started Smart Home Choice was that it was um, be an investor, not a landlord. And so okay. we taught a lot of our investors to, you know, what we were doing with rent to own and, and then we would partner with them, but we didn't always partner with them. If they wanted to, great. Mm-hmm. If not, that was fine as well too. Um, in regards to cash flow, uh, for like a rent to own deal, we were seeing anywhere from three, $300 a month to as high as seven, $800 a month. Okay. So that, so that norm kind of being that five to six is kind of what we're, where we were. Um, okay. in regards to a burr, you're, you're probably, I would say again, on the low end, anywhere from $300 a month, we've had it as high as 1200. Nice. Right. Yeah. So, okay. So what, it, like what's in your portfolio now? Are, are some rent to own still in your portfolio? Um, we have right now, I think I got one rent to own in my portfolio. Yeah. Um, some of those rent to owns, what ended up happening was, um, they weren't able to buy out. So then mm-hmm. they just became, uh, long-term single family rentals. Um, and with, with this, those, those tenants still in there. And, okay. um, and we've always said that if any time they were ready to leave, we would always give them back their down payment. 
that we didn't say that in the beginning, obviously, because it was always told that you would forfeit it. Yeah. But I'm just not in that business again of right. uh, taking their hard earned money. The credits, yeah, I get it. I, I, we're not going to return those. But if they put down a deposit of 10000 and they decided to leave, we would give them back to 10000 Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. That's, that's just something that we right. discussed and my partners have, are fine with as well, too. Well, it's certainly an, a nice thing to do. Uh, at the end of the day, you want them to be successful. And I've had a couple of people talk about rent to own on here. And it's not a good feeling when at the end of the day, they can't buy. And I've, I've it seen it and it's some very angry, uh, you know, angry words exchanged and, and, you know, people aren't going to be happy when, when that happens. So yeah, certainly if you're giving them the money back to, to go away, I'm sure that, that, uh, that helps that, that parting ways a little bit. For sure. Right. And, um, and again, obviously you're taking a look at the deal itself, you know, is a property under, is it above, is it, you know, how, what was that relationship like? Mm-hmm. But I, I would say, you know, um, in almost most cases of, if not all, we always return the deposit once they left, mm-hmm. especially if your home's gone up 60, 70, 80,000. Well, so that's the big dollars. thing, right? It's, if you're already winning on it. Yeah. It's a nicer thing to, especially if they can't, they're kind of gifting you all the equity that's in the house that, uh, that they're not going to be able to buy now. So, right. Yeah. That's yeah. Uh, that makes sense. So what would your typical term be? Uh, three years. So three it's usually so a three, three year term. Yeah. Okay. So give me one that you, you bought. What was the price point you bought one at? Um, so there was one that we, what that completed successfully. Sure. Yeah. Give me one that completed successfully. Yeah. So there was one that we had bought, I think it was maybe around three forty, somewhere around there uh, a few years ago. And Ajax? I buyout, uh, no, it was in Oshawa. Okay. Uh, the buyout price, let's say was approximately, I think it was maybe three ninety, Um, and, um, and they were able to, um, Purchase the property. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to take a look at in regards to, and I think this is important to talk about. And again, I don't do a lot of rent to owns today. I still Mm -hmm. do a couple that come through because we still have a rent to own business. So we still have uh, uh, clients that trickle in. Yeah. Um, But um, from what I've seen and the many years that I've done it, I would say we see about a 60% success rate, 40% failure rate. Um, and it's, it's not that rent to own doesn't work. Mm -hmm. The hard part is changing the family's habits. Yeah. They're the way that they, um, they spend money. It's, it's just, it's, it's, it's difficult to sometimes change it. Some of them are able to, depending on what happened, if it was just a quick slip or something like that. But sometimes, you know, I think that's where the difficulty lies is this, that they weren't able to change their habits, um, which is unfortunate, but, but the program works 100%. I know that for sure, because we've we've seen many successful rent to own clients. And I've, I've helped people get into them and I helped, uh, I helped a couple uh, buy out. I've seen, you know, I haven't done that many in terms of helping people, but I helped uh, a couple get into one and then eventually like four years later, uh, buy that property and they fixed their credit, but it didn't come without struggles. Like they, you know, at the, at the two and a half year mark, they contact me and say, Hey, we want to start getting a mortgage. And I pulled their credit. I'm like, but you didn't fix any of those things you were supposed to fix. Right. <laughs> so now they, okay, well we got to get this collections account paid. We got to do this, this, and this. And it doesn't come until, until they realize, Oh crap, I'm about to lose my deposit. If I don't do something here, right. um, then, uh, then they actually change. So, um, I think a lot of people the, the challenge with rent to own that I've seen and, and why I've, I've stressed this, I really do think that they need to have some sort of credit mentoring built into the program. Like you're, you're going to have to do this because we want you to succeed. Um, and, uh, if, if, you know, because they won't, they won't change, right. It, it'll take until that, you know, in the final hour that, uh, that they'll actually finally say, Oh, okay, now we need to do something. And then sometimes the advice back is, well, you know, you need two years to recover after you fix this. So you right. fix it and then wait two years. You don't have that time anymore. Okay. Well now where are you? So right. it's, it's a tricky thing, but yeah. It's so um, interesting to, to hear your perspective. I think 60% success rate actually sounds uh, still pretty solid. Uh, yeah. That it's hard to change people's uh, patterns and habits. Yeah. And, uh, and one of the things I think that helped us kind of get to, I think maybe that number and that a number maybe it'd be nice to see what the industry standard or percentages is, is probably is maybe a little bit lower than that 
it might be more 50 50. Um, but my wife was a mortgage agent. And mm -hmm. uh, so we, we actually, what we did was we said, Hey, look, we will help you restore your credit for free and we'll do yearly checkups with yeah. you. And the reason why she was willing to do that was because then she would also help and, and write the mortgage at the end as well yeah. too. So there was a bit of a, you know, an incentive as well. Yeah. That's, that's what I, I would do with clients too. Yeah. So I, on the yeah. mortgage side, I'd say, well, you know, this, you're not going to be able to get a mortgage, but you know, there are investors that will do a rent to own for you. And then on the back end, I'd be able to, uh, to help them out of it too. So, um, yeah, well, exactly. on that one that you bought for 340, um, what did you end up, um, making on cash flow per month? On that one, it was around 650, somewhere around there. And then the ROI, when yeah. we were done, we were probably sitting in at around 34, 35%. Okay, I'm correctly. just going to break down those numbers as my back of the envelope sort of calculation. So if your cash flow is about 23,400 over the course of three years, now a portion yep. of that would have been a credit to them. Like how much Correct. credit were they ac accumulating? Uh, $200 a month. So they, so 200 times 36 months. So they were getting a, a 37,000. So you, you were uh, upside on the sale. Uh, you had 39,000 sale less the 34,000. So you had a $50,000 upside on the sale and then upside on cash. Uh, you had, um, so 23,400 less the $7,200 credit you had to give them. And, um, I'm trying to think, would you have had, you also would have had mortgage pay down. We'll get into your mortgage. Yeah. So you would have done an 80% mortgage on that, right? Correct. Yeah. So the uh, mortgage at 80% would have been times 0.8. So about 272 and a pay down of say 3% on that mortgage on a yearly basis. So times 0.03 times three, uh, would have been about $24,000 in pay down. So the total return on there, well, actually you would have had some legal fees. So what, what do you figure your legals and transactional fees on that deal were? Uh, legal fees. Uh, well, you only have legal fees on the, on the front, right? I know you have the back as well Yeah, you got the back as well too. So legal fees, I don't know. You're probably maybe looking at around, call it 2,500 bucks front and back. 2,500. Yeah. Nothing even that significant. So these are this, you're about to see, well, people listening and watching are about to see why this is so significant. So $50,000 upside on the sale value less, yep. or sorry, plus the upside on the cash flow, 16,200. And then plus the pay down on the mortgage, 24,000 or so. These numbers could be off a bit, um, but it, you know, just ballpark minus yep. the $2,500 in, uh, in uh, legals. So about $88,000 return, give or take, I'm sure I'm yeah. off a bit. Yeah. Uh, somewhere around there. And then, so if we figure the down payment, so if you were a two, $272,000 mortgage, your down payment on that deal would have been um, 68,000. So the return on investment over the course of three years is 129%. That's uh, that's not too bad. Well, if we, we can divide that by three, if we want to, get that into yeah divide it by three yeah once i get it down to so that's uh that's 43 percent, but that's not adjusting for compounding so if you you know bring it down it'd be into the 30s as a compound interest equivalent right and then uh, now if you do it with a joint venture obviously you're splitting that again but but you have zero investment. <laughs> but if you don't put anything in then your infinity yeah your return infinity your return i i like the infinity return deals and and, and depending on your goals right everyone has different goals like some people right. want to grow fast you're going to have to get the zero down deals. You're going to have to find a way to be zero in because otherwise you can't grow. Um, right. If you don't mind growing slow, I've had other people on this podcast where they were just slow and steady. Things went up, they refinanced them, they bought more and it just kind of compounds as the market goes up. It all really comes back to, as we said, your goals and what you're trying to do. Absolutely. Uh, and, and you know what the interesting thing is? So when you, and, and this is actually kind of cool. I never actually gone through an actual transaction like that before. So that's good that you do that for your, for your audience and your followers mm -hmm. is that, I remember when I used to look at some of these numbers and then we would do some of these classes and, uh, and we would show them the numbers and people would like, whatever. And they would actually walk out and we were like, well, hold on a second. We got to dumb these numbers down. Like mm -hmm. we got to, we got to like under promise heavy yeah. because it's just when they're so used to seeing five, six, seven, eight percent then they all of a sudden start seeing like 35, 40%. They're like, this is not real. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and, and then afterwards, when they take a look at it, like, Hey Gary, you said we were only going to get like 20%. Like, well, yeah. Would you believe it if I told you 35, 40%? <laughs> this is more for newbie investors. Yeah. Obviously yeah, once absolutely. you've been in it for a while, you get to see and you understand, okay, hold on a second. These numbers are way higher. 
Right. And I think the beautiful thing is, is, is you can always relate it to people uh, in a way that, that they should be able to grasp. And that's that, you know, this is a more sophisticated investment. And because we yep. took the time to understand it, we can achieve higher results. Uh, the average right. person could, couldn't do this successfully. Like even you doing it well is 60% success rate. Um, now granted, the buyer, the buyout success rate, the tenant buyer's success is not your success. You're successful either way, as long as the market right. goes up uh, right. or even stays the same. But, yep. uh, you know, so I, I think, I think people get that. And, and you say, look, you know, you want completely passive, you go into a GIC and you get 1%. If you right. want very active, you can own a property and earn even more than this. But, you know, if we want to, if we want to do it this way, we're somewhere in the middle. Right. And so now when we teach the one class that we do, we do this one every single month, which is our fast start training class. And what we do is we actually go through all the numbers, what we do a burr. And, uh, and obviously we really kind of, you know, break down the numbers and we, we do is we actually make them go through it and we yeah. do it line by line what the down yeah. payment is, what's the land transfer tax. We go through every single line and then when they're done, they come with the ROI so they can see it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it's just eye-opening for them when they Absolutely. see this stuff. Like, holy crow. And so we do that because I think most people make the mistake in the beginning by not understanding the numbers. It's, it's yeah. about the numbers. If you don't understand the numbers, then you shouldn't just be jumping into an yeah. investment property. And, and I'll say this from experience when I, when I was teaching at Western, um, I would, you know, I'd have an income statement up and I'd be going through the numbers and, and when I was learning how to teach it, they would, you know, in my training, the pe people, you know, instructing me would say, make sure you explain what each line item is. Like, make sure you really help them, give them examples, like show them, like help them picture it. And I think some people just see numbers on a spreadsheet and they don't really relate it into something real. Like say, right. what, what is this thing? You know, when you see utilities, oh, okay, well that's Union Gas or, you know, Enbridge or whoever your, your supplier is, um, you know, just kind of making all those numbers relatable. Okay, why do we have mortgage pay down on here? What is that? Like, why is right. that here? And that's one of the more complex ones. Some people ask me like, why would you include mortgage pay down? Well, that's our money. We're gonna get it back when we sell the property. We're paying off the mortgage, the debt we have. Yeah, um, exactly. So just the digging into each individual number. So I'd like that, that you give them a chance, let them come up with it, let them ration their, rationalize their way through it. Um, right. That's a really valuable exercise that I would encourage. Anyone right. listening to the podcast right now, I, I'm sure you have a, a sheet available. I have a sheet available on my website if you just go to andrew hinescom forward slash cash flow. And you can download the cash flow sheet I use and crunch your own numbers, ask yourself critical questions, go through each one and, and ask, what does this mean? And, mm -hmm. uh, and also play sensitivity with it. What if that number's higher than I think? What if it's lower? Which ones are, which ones are bound to vary? You know, your vacancy rate is bound to vary. Your maintenance is bound to uh, vary year to year. Um, right. So anyways, okay, not to get uh, distracted, Gary, I want you yeah. to school me on your thoughts on what is going on with the world right now. <laughs> so <laughs> it is June 2nd and, okay. uh, and Gary uh, has a lot of wisdom. I've heard it. Yeah. Um, geez. I mean, wh where do you want to go with this? You know, do you want to touch on, did they do the right thing and shutting things down? Do you want to touch on, you know, the, what kind of recovery are we going to have or at least what I think? I think both of those things are a good place to start. Yeah. Well, look, um, obviously I have a concern with, and I'm not going to try and downplay the fact that this virus is, isn't dangerous, uh, and, and, and killing people by any means. Mm -hmm. Um, I always just kind of wonder if it was the right thing to do, especially when you start hearing now the suicide rates, what's going up with that, um, the destruction of these businesses and these businesses now that are getting these bailouts and really what they're calling them now zombie businesses, because some of these businesses should have already died and they haven't. And so then now can they survive in this new world? And many of them probably are not going to be, which then are now going to lead to even more job losses. And so when you look at the stock market, what kind of a recovery is that? That doesn't even look, how does that, it look, it, it, you know, you look at it like, wow, it's not even that bad. But if you look at it with some sensible eyes, there's no way that it can sustain that because it's not built on anything. You know what I mean? So think about the, you know, well, well, I guess a few places, Amazon and Walmart, mm -hmm. but look at all the other things that are the airlines. So then how is the stock market rallying like that? What's getting yeah. pumped into it? If you just think of it, step back and look at it logically. 
So I don't see how that can sustain itself and, and it's got to come back down. Um, and so obviously I've got some concerns, I think going into, cause it's all about jobs. And if you don't have jobs, then, then what happens to an economy? And so that's my big yep. concern. Okay. Right? And on, now, on that point, I think there's a lot more we can go in, but you know, you're going to, you were going to yep. say something else. Keep, keep going. Um, no. And so I was, um, and so my, the next big concern is, um, the second lockdown, which they've been talking about. And I have a legitimate concern that I think they're going to lock this down again, outside of whatever the numbers are showing. If you, if you kind of really get into the numbers of the people that are dying and again, anybody that dies is one too many. Anybody that dies from influenza mm-hmm. is one too many car accidents, one to anything. It doesn't yeah. matter what it is, but uh, at, at what, uh, at what stake do you, do you, do you do this at is my, is the concern that right. I have. Well, we always had influenza. We've had bad years. 2017 was a really bad year for in- influenza. But we did not yeah. tell the population that you're a monster if you don't wear a mask because, because people out there have influenza and you might have it. So you're a monster. You're going to kill people if you don't wear a mask. We as, as human beings, I don't know if I heard you talking about this, but who was it? I heard somebody talking about this, that we're, human beings were risk takers. We're risk takers by walking out the door in the morning. We're risk takers by getting into our car, by getting on a train, by getting on a plane, anything we do, there is an inherent risk. And at some level, we analyzed that risk and decided life is worth living. I'm willing to take the risk because I want to live. I want to, I want to live and and enjoy life. And, and I think that people do need to step back and, and look at the situation and say, do I want the new normal, the normal I'm willing to admit to be, you know, is, is, is a thing to be people walking around with face masks on. And I, I don't exactly. get to see somebody smile. I don't get to shake somebody's hand. I'm not having that. I don't agree to that normal. <laughs> Neither do I. Yeah. Neither do I. There's a really good podcast that I listened to about four years ago. Um, I don't know if you've heard of Rich Roll, the Rich Roll podcast. I do, I do know of Rich Roll, yeah. Yeah, and uh, man, I can't remember the doctor's name. I should, I should look it up. But anyways, uh, what she was talking about was called um, Live Dirty, Eat Clean. And, and, and I'm going to continue. And after I heard that podcast, I thought it was brilliant. And I'm going to continue mm-hmm. to live like that. And so essentially what she's saying is get the viruses into your body. Mm-hmm. We are 70, 80% virus, fungus, and bacteria. The other 20% or 25% is human cells. So yeah. we are a virus already. And so if you look at kids, there's a main reason why these, the most kids have not been impacted by this because they're always putting their hands in their mouth. Yeah. They're getting the viruses and the bacteria in their mouth. Think of this. Think of, have you been to uh, Dominican Republic? I haven't, no. Okay. So if you go to Dominican Republic, you cannot drink the water there. Okay. The reason why, because you come back and you will be on the toilet for the next three months. You're, it's going to be yeah. a, a disaster for you. Yeah. And it's because of the bacteria that they have in their water. However, they can drink it. No problems yeah. because they're, they've built up an immunity to it. Mm-hmm. And so am I anti-vaccination? No, I think there are certain things that I think that, you know, they've created a cure for like polio and uh, some other, a few other things that, yes, I, I think you should take those things. However, for the common flu, I think you have to allow your own immune system to build up its own mm-hmm. defenses and fight it. And so you know, they, they've talked about like the tonsils, the tonsils is your first line of defense. That's like your door. And I don't know if you remember back in the eighties, you used to rip people, the people's tonsils out. Yeah. That used it's to like, rip, it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like ripping your front door out. And so what they're saying now is that when you get that vaccination, that's like a, um, a burglar just getting injected right into your living room. Oh, and yeah. so now your defense systems have to fight differently. You know, and so, and again, look, I'm not a doctor, so mm-hmm. fact check all this, whoever's yeah. listening to this stuff, right? I want to make sure you do that. However, I think where they failed was they didn't do a good job in protecting the elderly. I, yeah. I think they should have really locked down those old age homes. And, and so hopefully this opens up conversations on, um, one, not paying those, um, those workers enough money to having them work from two, three, four different locations. And, 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 you know, inadvertently, unfortunately, they were, you know, spreading that to those elderly people, which, yeah. which was sad. They should have locked them mm-hmm. down. And, you know, uh, you know, a lot of the fear, a lot of our fear comes from, you know, our consumption of American news. And you look at uh, states like New York State, Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York State, uh, forced yeah. retirement homes to take COVID infected uh, residents back. Uh, he actually mandated that they had to and they could not refuse. 
And, uh, and then he wanted to uh, later on give them indemnity if, if they ever got a lawsuit from it. But people died in large number because of that. Uh, there were, yeah. there were some bad decisions made in all of this. Like, you know, some of them, uh, you could say, well, it's hard to know what was right. I think that that one we can, we can agree was, uh, was not a good, good choice, but, uh, hindsight sure. is 2020. It, it, hindsight is always going to be 2020, but I think, look, when it was coming and the way it was mm-hmm. coming this way, I think we knew that it was impacting older people. Mm-hmm. I think we knew that. And I think we also knew that it was impacting people that had compromised immune systems. Yeah. You know? And so, I think I saw some the other day. I can't remember the exact quote of it, but anyways, delayed death doesn't mean that you escape death. Yeah. Right. It's true. Like a lot of these, these, these cases were, you know, they were maybe just, this was more of a catalyst than it was a cause. I would say that's probably in large scale. uh, True. Right. Um, Yeah. Okay, and, look, and, and, and I get it. it no, no, no. And, and look, and I, and I get it. Look, it, yeah. it's, it's a tough conversation to have. And I, and I don't mm-hmm. want to come across being insensitive. I don't yep. want anybody to die. However, again, my big concern is, yeah. uh, are these companies that could be impacted. Now, on yeah. the other side of this as well, too. Um, and I'm not even saying this because my business has been impacted. My business has been impacted significantly. However, I can sustain this. I'm, 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 I'm mm-hmm. okay. Most people don't have three month savings or four month savings. Most right. people aren't going to be able to recover from this. However, I do think that anytime there are times of um, turmoil and, and, and the issues that we're going through today, that innovation comes out of this. Mm-hmm. And so I think the sooner that people can understand that the inform- or the industrial age is going is slowly dying and that we're moving into the information age, I think it's going to be a lot easier for people to move forward. And so I think it's about pivoting, shifting, and, uh, and, and just adapting to change and not fighting it. Uh, what's happening is y- you're seeing a shrinkage from 10 years to one year. All this was going to happen anyways. It's just over a shorter period of time right. now. Interesting. Well, I mean, and things might shift back the other way. I know, uh, obviously, America is going to go far more away from Chinese manufacturing. Maybe some stuff comes back yep. uh, onto our shores. Maybe we do, to a certain degree, come back. But I know what you're saying. Like, there was a movement to work from home. That was already starting. And right. this accelerated it. So, so to a certain degree, I, th- I think that that is definitely just accelerating what, what was inevitable. Uh, for, for sure. sure. And, and, and I guess to clarify the industrial age, what I mean is that more commercial space. I think you're going to see mm-hmm. more companies that may be downtown Toronto, King and Bay that have two floors paying quarter million dollars a year. Do they need to go fully back? Probably not. Yeah. They can probably downsize a bit. And I think you're going to start seeing that. Yeah. And what might potentially, and who knows, maybe open that up now to maybe some of the housing crisis that we've had. Maybe sure. you turn some of those commercial spaces into affordable homes. Because I think what you're going to see as well, too, is an exodus. And again, I don't know. I'm not Nostradamus by any means. But I think you might see an exodus from people that are living downtown Toronto to wanting now more rural properties, wanting yeah. more land, wanting a backyard where they mm-hmm. can actually go out as opposed to being on the 40th floor and you can only have two people in an elevator. Yeah. Good luck getting downstairs. Oh yeah. Yeah. I never, I never really understood it. I mean, Toronto is fun. Don't get me wrong. I, I, mm-hmm. like, I love hanging out down there, but, but it's a, uh, it's tiny spaces. I do like, I do like having a backyard for sure. And, and so, and I remember there was a time just before we bought our cottage, me and my wife, we were looking at condos downtown. Then we went down there. We're like, you know what, why don't we just, if we ever need to come down here, we'll just rent a hotel for the night, you know, or, or, or do an Airbnb, let somebody else deal with it. Yeah. Why, why do we need to buy a space down there for a whole year and try and figure out this whole, it was just for us again not knocking it it just wasn't for us yeah right so. okay so so transition to one more thing that i think was important yep. um you talked about inflation and how you thought two uh, two to three percent is absolute garbage and just before we yep. dig into this uh inflation is the things that we buy going up in values uh, going up in, in cost not value yep. um so so they would be you know if we're buying a basket of grocery goods uh various different things that we might buy um we have a consumer price index that measures these things. However, the consumer price index does not fairly include all goods and it is manipulatable mm-hmm. by our government. Uh, they say two to 3%, but I don't believe it either. Tell me what your thoughts are. Yeah, it's nowhere near that. Yeah. Just, just, if you even just take a look. Okay, so first, let's just talk about your raise at work. And um, 
this is when it really hit home for me. And so at the time I was working at TD Bank, I think I was making, I don't remember, maybe 75, 80,000 a year. And I got a raise of $1,000. And that's not bad. That's pretty mm -hmm. decent, okay? Um, as some people don't get raises for years. And so when I did the calculation on it, it worked out to like 1.5 or 1.6%. So even at that, I wasn't even keeping up with the quoted number of inflation. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so then now let's take a look at what real estate has done for the last, you know, several years. So you have to add that number yeah. into it. Um, then you got to take a look at, you know, uh, the cost of groceries and that's yeah. much higher. And so when you really yeah. take a step back, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I don't think they include groceries in the consumer price index. I, I think there's only a few that are actually included in that. Um, yeah, I have to, to double check it, but yeah, I've heard the notion. I, I, I can't remember where I saw this, but they said that that was, that was too volatile. Is that, that, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <he's> included. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so the number for inflation and that's what's stealing people's wealth is, is yeah. inflation. And, yep. and here's the unfortunate part. And, and then, look, I'm not an expert at this by any means, but the unfortunate part is they don't teach any of this stuff in schools so that people can have some healthy debates so they can actually show them some numbers like, you know, or even just teaching them credit cards and the difference between yeah. compound interest and simple interest or what is a mortgage and how do you calculate it? And um, let's all understand what a credit report is and how to read it. But yet the oh, very yeah. first, the very first uh, day in, in, in college or university, they have these tables lined up and they're going to give you credit cards and you have no idea how to use this weapon. And it's a weapon. Oh, and yeah. you have no idea what impact it's going to have on your credit report because you don't even know what a credit report is. Oh, yeah. Man. Right. And, and so I'll give you an example. My, uh, my daughter, she went to Spain earlier uh, this year. And, um, and so she's come up to a lot of our investment clubs and she's done my bookkeeping. And when her friends come over, we sit down and we do whiteboards and we go through inflation and what to do with a dollar um, and all that. So, you know, she, she understands how it all works and how real is, you know, obviously learning it and uh, much more knowledgeable than I would say I was at her age. And um, so she was taking a year off. Uh, from going to college because she wanted to go to Spain and do au pair, which is essentially a family takes her in mm -hmm. and, um, you know, teach them English and they'll teach her Spanish. And so prior to going over there, she wanted to get a credit card. And so she went in and they denied her. And I was, so I know the branch manager incredibly well. So I'm like, what do you mean he denied you? So I went in there and I go, well, come she didn't get the credit card. And he goes, well, um, you know, she's not going to college. Uh, and so I'm like, but, but hold on a second what does that have to do with anything? You know, cause he's come up to the investment clubs and he sees what we do and he knows exactly what I do and he knows my portfolio. And, uh, and I can say, so I told him, so you see how this is rigged. She has way more financial education than most kids are going to have that go into college or university, but yet, and, and she's, and she knows how to use it, but yet you're going to deny her. And so then you can see right then and there. And I pointed out to him that how the system is designed to, to not to benefit people, but to actually kind of keep them down in the yeah. beginning and not give them that head start. It's almost like our government doesn't want people to be educated and have a well-formed opinion. No, and I get it. I understand why. Think about if you were running a country, would you want to financially educate your, your country or do you then say, don't take out financial education, put them into schools, I need this guy to be an electrician. I need this guy to be a plumber. Yeah. I need this guy to be a this. I need this. So you need to create worker bees. You cannot yeah. allow everybody to understand the financial education, how it all works. I, I, it took yeah. me a while to kind of figure that out. And I was like, oh, I get it. I need worker bees. <laughs> if I was running the country, I need yeah. worker bees for sure. And I'm not knocking those jobs. I'm not. I get it. Right. That, you know, those are great jobs as well, too. But some people, I think everybody should at least still understand how it all works. Well, and you need to invest what comes out of that job. And yeah, I think that, that the system relies on us all continuing on. And if we became educated enough on, say, real estate investment, we'd eventually not need that job. And then we have a choice whether or not we work. And it takes people right. out of the workforce. Um, it, it sounds it, it, like, you know, it sounds a little sinister, um, but... Uh, I don't know. That's how I see it too. You know, and I, I'm not saying that I know for a fact, it just seems to me it's too, 
there's no way that's just a coincidence that it all happens to be that way. Um, well, they, yeah, they took it out. 100%. We could, we could 100% teach people how to do this stuff. We could teach financial literacy. We could teach uh, bookkeeping and accounting in high school. We could teach basic economics and basic politics so people could have well-formed opinions because I believe it's our civic duty to have an opinion on political and economic issues. And in order to have an opinion, we need to know the basics. We need Absolutely. to understand the basics. Yeah, I, I don't know if your listeners have ever read the book, uh, The Creature from Jekyll Island, but that's a great book where it talks about, um, uh, I don't know if it was Rockefellers, but they actually took yeah. financial education out of the schools. And so yeah, it was when they formed and, the and Fed so, too, right? That, yeah, so I think that was taken out in 1905, and I think they formed the, the Federal Reserve in 1913 or 1914. Yeah. yeah, so it was yeah. the Rockefellers, J.P. Morgan, uh, and Rock, Rothschild, Rothschild family. There was another, yeah. I think, um, yeah. Warburg, I Warburg family. Yes, yeah. exactly. There's yep. another one in there too. Uh, you can read the book on it. Um, yeah, they created the Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve is actually a private bank. That's another discussion yes. for another day. It's crazy, crazy. It's not actually government owned, uh, which it is isn't. insane. <laughs> insane. It isn't. Uh, it isn't. It, it's, yeah, it's, it's a great book. And yeah. uh, it, it's, again, people just need to educate yeah. themselves on money and how it works and understand what happened in, you know, with, with money being tied to gold and, you know, what happened yeah. in the 1970s with Richard Nixon. Those are all important things to understand understand if you don't yes. understand how money works and you just can't understand how this all works yeah. and then so you just get caught in the system of i'll just give my money to the bank and let them invest it for right me. yeah yeah you have to absolutely have to start questioning what you're told don't don't just take somebody else's opinion this is good or this politician did this bad or whatever um uh, i strongly encourage people to dig into this stuff it does not take that long to learn the basics um, it, you know, if you'd like to have an opinion on something and you need a little direction, like, you know, shoot me a message and I can maybe provide you with some resources, um, that, that will help, you know, get you started. But, uh, Gary, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, where should people reach out to you if, uh, if they want to follow you or they want to get in touch? Yeah. Um, so if, uh, if you want to uh, reach out to me, um, my email is Gary, G-A-R-Y at smarthomechoice.ca. Um, if you want to find me on Instagram or Facebook or uh, LinkedIn, any of those uh, social media, um, you can just type in Gary Herbert and, you, and you'll find me. All right. So Gary, once all this is done, where's the first place you're going to travel? The first place I'm going to travel, you know what? So like I mentioned earlier, um, my daughter was in Spain. We actually had to pull her back. Uh, two, we pulled her back two weeks or two days before they shut down the airport. Um, and so me and my wife were actually supposed to go to Spain uh, next week. Okay. Um, to go and pick her up and go and hang out there and, uh, and, and check out Europe. So I think... I think I'd like to go there and check nice. it out. I really, I really do because when I was there for a few days, it was, it was just a beautiful, different experience. Uh, but if not, I'll probably go down to, uh, I don't know if you've been in Antigua. Antigua's beautiful. So I'm maybe not, just go no. there and lay on the beach and, uh, yeah, and uh, get drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great, man. All right, Gary, uh, that was a pleasure. Uh, really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, we'll definitely have to connect further. I've got like another hour and a half worth of questions to ask you and talk to you about. But <laughs> oh, anytime. I enjoyed this. Thanks for reaching yeah. out and thanks for having me in your show. And uh, yeah, I, I hope your audience gets some, uh, some, some great info out of this. Oh, I'm Thank sure you. they did. Thanks for watching today's episode. Just a friendly reminder to please rate and review this podcast on iTunes. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure that you smash the like and subscribe and notification bell. Uh, and also leave a comment. And hey, while you're at it, why not share this episode with somebody you think it could help? It helps this podcast grow and I would really appreciate it. Thanks again. We'll see you on the next episode.